The wilderness can be an enchanting place, but nature's captivating beauty oftentimes make us forget her dark and unforgiving side. Hunters and those who spend the most time in the natural world have first-handedly witnessed this. There are secrets left unrevealed, mysteries left unsolved, and knowledge we have yet to comprehend. But each year, more people naively venture off into the wild and fall victim to supernatural occurrences, accidents, and the raw power that makes nature so revered. So whether you're on your way out to the stand, on a hike, or gathered around the campfire, here are five stories to remind you of the events that can unfold. This happened to me when I was 12 years old, growing up in the 70s. I didn't hunt, mainly because I didn't have anyone to take me, but before my dad passed, he taught me how to fish. So I would sneak away to a little creek in my neighborhood to do so from time to time. It was just my mom and I, one Sunday, traveling to a special second service at another church. I remembered being annoyed with her because I didn't want to go, but just relax at home before school tomorrow. I was a big kid, right? Needless to say, she got her way and it was a pretty quiet trip. We get onto the freeway and I'm looking out the window to see that we are now driving behind a black pickup truck and on the back of it is this beautiful black Labrador Retriever. He was just enjoying the ride like any doggo would with his tongue hanging out and enjoying the breeze. I'm sure he was getting plenty of it. It was quite windy that day. There were clues that he was more than just a pet, but a legit bird dog. But whether they were coming from a hunt or going, I don't know. Growing up in the country, I still knew what hunting and recreational sports looked like. Everything is normal for a while, and we kept pace with the truck and other cars cluttered nearby. Watching the dog made me feel a little bit better about my situation. Animals have that calming effect, but I turned my attention to other sights around. Then, in my peripheral, I see the truck make a lane change in front of us into the right lane, and the next thing I knew, something black comes flying diagonally towards the side of my window. My mom slightly panic swerved, and it misses, but from my mirror, I saw the black dog wallowing in agony on the side of the road. Mom regained the lane and slowed down to see if I was okay, but I was more worried about the dog, and the worst part, the truck he came from was still going. He probably didn't know yet that his dog just went flying out of the back of his pickup, and we couldn't go back to recover it. Thankfully, I could see that another car was in the process of doing that, so I yelled to my mom that we had to catch up to the truck, which she protested for a moment, but then floored it. We then saw the truck, now a few cars ahead, slowing down and pull off to the side, in which the owner, dressed in duck hunting camo, frantically got out, looking around in the truck bed, thinking maybe his dog just laid down. We pulled up shortly afterwards, and I jumped out, running to the guy to let him know what happened. He looked like he was about to open the floodgates when the other car pulled up behind my mom's and a woman on the passenger side got out. We could hear the dog's cries from their back seat. The man runs over and the woman said to be careful getting him out because it seems his leg was broken. She helped him carefully move the dog from her car to the back seat of his pickup. The man graciously thanked us. He was holding his composure, but we knew he was going to cry in the car. Aside from a busted leg, it seemed Dogga was going to be fine. Still sad, but after that, I was actually glad my mom forced me to go with her that day. I'm also glad that the guy decided to change lanes when he did, because if that had happened while he was in any other lane, I'd hate to imagine the sight I would have seen. So about four to five years ago, my buddy called to say that he shot a doe, but she ran into the woods and wanted an extra set of eyes to help track. I, of course, got my stuff together and headed over. By the time I got to the farm he was hunting, it was night, but we still headed out across the field. 
Now, if you've ever been to the country, you'll notice the lack of street lights or any of the lights aside from homes. While approaching the tree line, I noticed what appeared to be a porch light through the woods, so I asked him how far off that house was and what other houses were around. He assured me that there were no other houses or anything. I assumed he was confused, so I pointed the light out to him, and he was baffled. At this point, we're 200 yards from the tree line, and without anything to compare the light to, it was hard to gauge how far into the woods it was, but it appeared to be 100 yards in. It's about then we realize the light is moving toward us, but not like someone walking with a flashlight or headlamp. There was no sweeping, no up and down bobs, and was about eight feet off the ground. This is not easy terrain either. It had been logged years before, so the underbrush was extreme. Mix that in with old skitter ruts and everything else. We immediately knew something was off. It moved smooth as butter and completely silent through the woods. When the lights eventually got to the field, it stopped for a moment and traveled to the left of our perspective for about 50 yards. Stopped, went up about 15 feet, then back down, then back up. It was eerie, but didn't seem dangerous, so I turned to my buddy and asked if we should get closer to it, but without missing a beat, the only thing he had to say was, why? Right when he said that, it was as if the light focused on us, like we had surprised it or something, and the entire area around us lit up with a dim light, as if it was a full moon. But there was no moon in the sky that night. We were both officially freaked out and agreed it was time to get out of there. We hightailed it back across the field, daring to look back. We debated about it, but returned the next morning for the deer. We searched around for possible explanations, but couldn't find any. Several weeks went by, and I decided to tell my dad about it. He knows the owner neighboring the farm and thought it would interest him. Well, come to find out, the guy told my dad in a serious tone that he too have had many encounters with this light before, but never told anyone out of the fear of being deemed crazy. I know it wasn't a human with a flashlight, wasn't a drone, and I don't know of any animals that are capable of this. I do have a guess, though. After hours of research, I came across a Native American folklore that spoke about orbs of light that protect and guide white-tailed deer. I always wondered if that was what we saw, and it was trying to show us where his deer was so it didn't go to waste. I'd be interested in hearing what anyone else have to say about this. They say, whatever can happen will. So true. I agreed to go early season bow hunting in a part of the state that's pretty much bear country. Now, I've never been here, but my friend has multiple times and assured me that he has never seen a bear. Black bear, to be exact. Guess it doesn't matter. A bear is still a bear. We get settled into our spots around four o'clock. We got in early because the walk-in was a ways away from where we parked. All is good when I hear rustling noises to my left behind me. I can't exactly see what it is through the leaves, but from the footfall, it sounded heavy. Here I'm thinking, it's just another hunter sounding like a herd of elephants thrashing through, but I nearly lost my shh when the creature came into full view. You guessed it. The very thing my friend said he'd never seen the many times he's hunted here. Shortly after I took this picture, the bear walked to the base of the tree, and it was just sniffing around the area. Okay, no big deal. Just cool to look at. Then he began to climb up. Now very big deal. It slipped my mind that of all the bear species, black bears are excellent climbers, and he was coming up fast. I immediately realized... There was no way to shoot a bow straight down from a climber. I started yelling and frantically looking for something to throw, but there was nothing in reach, except my new and expensive bow. I throw my own leg first. Luckily, he stopped halfway up and just looked at me, climbed down and walked off. 
My friend hunting a few hundred yards away thought I fell out of the tree after hearing all the noise I made. The bear was never aggressive, just more so curious. Guess it's worth mentioning. I had just eaten some peanut butter crackers, shook the crumbs out of the bag, and put the trash in my pocket. I didn't think anything of it. You may find the story more comical, but regardless, to have a full-grown bear walk up to you and climb towards you is scary enough. I was a first-time self-taught bow hunter at the age of 17. This is a time before smartphones, hunting apps, and the internet was the go-to place for information. Just books, a map, and putting boots to the ground. I shot my first deer, a doe, on public land on my second sit ever from the ground. No blind, just a stool to sit on and natural cover I put together with fallen branches and other forest cover. It was an evening sit over a small food plot when she stepped out with a few other does. Adjacent to the small plot, there was a bedding area consisting of dense young trees that she darted into. The blood trail was heavy, so I thought it would be no problem recovering her before dark and that she probably didn't go too far into it. I still gave it a good 30 minutes before pursuit. I marked the starting point with a piece of toilet paper and continued to do so every couple of yards in. The trail was so good that I felt I could walk up on her at any moment. But suddenly, the trail became a bit faint, so much so that I started to confuse the red specks on leaves as blood. On top of that, I was at least a good 75 yards into the brush now, and light was fading fast. Sure, I could have backed out, but I lived an hour away, and I had to work the next day, so it would be a couple of hours before I could come back and recover her. On top of it being the early season, I refused to let my first public land deer spoil in the heat, but also knew that if the blood dries, distinguishing what's blood and leaf spots would be harder. With fleeting light, the least I could do is pick back up the trail to mark it before calling it quits, but by the time I did, it was so dim and light that the thicket was just shadows of trees. Also, I had lost sight of the last strip of toilet paper I set to find my way back. Now completely dark, every direction looked the same, and I really couldn't tell which way I came from or which way I should go. Even with my little flashlight, I couldn't see much past its dull shine. And at this point, I'm making educated guesses on the possible way out and moving the best I can through the thicket of trees, hoping to stumble upon my last mark. Prior to, I checked the time I started tracking and an hour and 20 minutes had gone by. I had thought to continue marking my exit trail with the toilet paper so at least I wouldn't be walking in circles. But then I thought it would probably just confuse me when I come back the next day. I pressed on until suddenly a terrifying growl froze me in my tracks and caused my blood to run cold. I guess now I should mention that this public land also has black bears. I hear loud rustling, but can't see which direction it's coming from. Questions race through my mind like, is it a female with cubs, a huge male? Is it even a bear or something worse? Whatever it was, it was probably drawn to the blood of my deer as I wasn't wounded or didn't have any food on me. Maybe I am the food. I'm petrified in the middle of a thicket, armed with nothing but a dim flashlight, bow, somewhat good knife, and some toilet paper. At least two of those things would be most useful. I stopped moving for a while, afraid that if I move, it will move too. I kept thinking, what if it's being quiet because I'm being stalked? And I envisioned a hideous creature like a wendigo surprising me from behind. My breath shortened as I intently listened to the nightly sounds around me trying to pinpoint the creature's whereabouts. All but the crickets were silent. I really don't know how long I stood there, but the uncertainty caused panic to set in. I had to make a move, either stay put and hope to make it till morning, or find a way out. That panic turned to adrenaline 
until I came up with the idea to take a strip of toilet paper and tie it around one of the trees to mark my exit starting point. That way I would know I've been to this point already and that this trail from here on is not the blood trail. I carefully planned my direction and marked nearly every inch of the way until eventually I exited the thicket into some open hardwoods. I'm relieved, but not out of the woods yet. At least now I have better visibility around me and in somewhat of a familiar area, judging by the twisted trees. I marked my last exit point and started 200 more yards out of the woods towards where I knew my car should be. A total of three hours from when I shot the deer, saw the last blood, and trying to find my way out. The possibilities of being lost, stuck, and attacked? Not a fun moment for a first-timer. Still, I went back the following day after work and in mid-80-degree heat to recover the doe. Ended up finding her within 20 yards of where I exited that night, had I just gone maybe further to the left. It was a hard shot, and my arrow was still inside her. The meat spoiled, but not too bad due to her being under the shade of the trees. I just made her into dog food for our senior dog, Jackie. She enjoyed it. Despite the ordeal, I felt proud about seeing the process all the way to the end. I was born and raised in the Southeast United States. A friend of my friend and hunting buddy, whom I refer to as Dan for the story, invited us on a rabbit hunt he hosts on his property in Alabama every year. It was February, and anyone from these parts would tell you that it indeed gets cold here during that time, regardless of being the South. It was to take place over a holiday weekend. Come the morning of the hunt, the host, Dan, myself, and several others who were invited stood around chatting, sipping morning refreshments while getting our gear together. Not to forget the dogs. Now there were two sets of beagles for this hunt, one pack belonging to the host and the others to one of the guys in the group. I'll just call him B for this story. The morning went well. We started with the host's dogs who stirred up a few nice rabbits. A fond moment was when I and another guy in the group shot at one at the same time. We called it a draw, and I suggested to split it, but he offered me the whole thing. The morning was filled with jokes and good sports, then we broke for the afternoon. For the afternoon hunt, B's dogs were up so the first set of dogs could rest from the morning. He put a tracking collar on three of them while others started snipping around to get on a scent. I didn't know much about rabbit hunting as I'm more of a deer hunter, but I had guessed he put them on the most experienced dogs in the pack, assuming the rest would follow their lead. These little guys really enjoyed what they do, and it was enjoyable watching them work. The second portion was pretty slow, having gotten one after about 30 minutes in and missed another. An hour or so into the hunt, we had lost sight of some of the dogs, but could still hear them in the distance periodically barking. B monitored the device in his hand that locates the dog's whereabouts. I'm not sure how he was reading it, but I was reading the expression on his face. For a moment, he didn't seem too concerned until a little later when we caught up to a few of the dogs. They were still doing their thing as I watched with intrigue, passively hearing a few words between B and two others in the group. He was showing them the device and I just remembered hearing a, I don't know, followed by a, let's go see. Then they started heading off in another direction. My buddy Dan was talking with the host a little distance away, and I kind of kept to myself for a minute until another hunter struck up a conversation, but I passively listened. I started to wonder where B and those others went off to. I would soon have an answer. Moments later, we could hear one of them calling out to us through the woods. The rest of us pinpointed his location and met up with him only to hear some news that spiked my adrenaline. We all rushed to the location. 
Upon coming up on it, we could hear the agonizing howls echoing as B and the other guy worked to cut away a few briars. We all pitched in to help. Luckily, the dead briars were easy to clear and was the least of the concern, because now we all stood around the circular structure and peered down into the dark earth. An old well. We could hear the dog, but couldn't quite see it, even if the tracking collar had a light on it and in full daylight at four in the afternoon. I remember having a light in my pack and shined it down. We were all surprised at how deep it was and for such a little dog to have fallen. It had to be a good 25 feet plus, and naturally, it had water. Lucky for the dog, somehow there seemed to be a shallow end of the well. We don't know what he was standing on to keep him just above the water, but we still knew he was on borrowed time and had to act fast. We started to gather up any material we could use. There was a bit of junk scattered here and there around the property, and eventually we got together a piece of rope, half a fire hose, and a leash, which we made a slip knot at the end to try and loop around his neck and pull him out. It didn't quite work because the dog was constantly moving from shallow end to deep in panic and once we finally did manage to get it over his head, he slipped out of it as we started to pull him up. After multiple attempts, we were running out of options. When I go on hunting trips, I like to bring any gear that may be useful. Honestly, I was fully prepared to run back to camp to get my tree harness and have them lower me down into the well to get him. I may be a hunter, but I still have a soft spot for animals. His helpless howls were tugging at my heart. Obviously, the others didn't think that was a good idea. If the well's walls were to collapse, we'd have a whole nother rescue mission on our hands. Then I remembered. On the way to the property, there was a blue rubber basket with holes laying in a pile of junk. I brought it up and immediately went to go get it as the others called down to calm the dog. Come on in there, man. Come on, man. Come on, big boy. Crawl up in there, big boy. One more shot. Come on, one more shot. There you go. That's a big boy. Come on. One more time. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. There you go, boy. Get in now. Oh, get in now. The basket was not only big enough for the dog to crawl into, but also had two hoop ends perfect for tying rope through. Nothing beats a failure but a try. The holes would allow the basket to sink low enough for the dog to get into. Shortening the details, we tied both ends, but the opening was too narrow for the dog to get in. Then, after reconfiguring, it eventually worked and we pulled the dog to safety. It was literally one of those miracle moments, a blessing from God. I can't stress enough how lucky this pup was. After examining him, he was sore, but didn't have any broken bones, wounds, etc. B just wrapped him in a towel and warmed him in the truck as we all called it a day after that. The host had called the fire department a little before we pulled the dog out and they arrived just afterwards to seal off the well. Honestly, even the host was surprised at the whole ordeal. He had brought this land at auction and hunted it many years, never knowing the well was there. This isn't totally out of the ordinary, as much of the southeast was once dotted in farmland. One farm could easily have as many as 15 dug wells, which many are forgotten over time. To think that somehow, this could have easily been one of us. I'm just thankful it all worked out, because surely it didn't for whatever other critter may have fallen victim to the well. I can see